President Dwight Eisenhower, reflecting on his military career, once said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. What I think he meant by this is that planning forces us to inventory resources, identify needs, consider contingencies, and to get to know the people we're working with and how they think. Then when the unforeseen happens, as it always does, we have a better idea of alternatives and can work more easily with our teams to make adjustments. In the world of workforce development, this means focusing on the communities, institutions, and individuals tasked with translating high-level policy and funding into on-the-ground services. For all its flaws, the federal workforce system was predicated on the idea that local leaders know local needs better than a distant bureaucracy and should be empowered to make the most of the dollars taxpayers give them. Workforce boards are expected to lead their communities in cross-sector collaboration and information gathering to find gaps in the labor market and create training options to help workers and employers fill them. In workforce lingo, this is called building sector strategies. Unfortunately, a variety of factors have bogged down many local workforce leaders, pushing them away from innovation and toward maintenance of the status quo. As a result, the system's objective of empowerment and innovation often goes unrealized. But every once in a while, we find an exception, and that is the topic of today's episode. My guests today on Hardly Working are Tamara Atkinson, Drew Chevrolet, and Greg Compton, three local workforce and education leaders in Austin, Texas. In 2016, these three brought local leaders together behind the Austin Metro Area Master Community Workforce Plan. Tamara Atkinson is the CEO of Workforce Solutions Capital Area, the local workforce development board in Austin, and the chief architect of the Master Community Workforce Plan. Drew Chevrolet is the former senior vice president for policy, advocacy, mobility, and talent at the Austin Chamber of Commerce. And Greg Compton is the associate director of the Ray Marshall Center for the Study of Human Resources an affiliate of the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. I'm also joined by AEI adjunct fellow Mason Bishop and Caleb Seiber, my former research assistant, who collaborated on a recent case study on Austin's efforts. In this episode, we discuss the origins and impact of the plan, the importance of collaboration across sectors and workforce initiatives, and the role of independent research and local data collection in shaping workforce practice. We also discuss the challenges the local workforce system faces in the COVID moment and hear unique insights about how Austin's leadership is adapting to address those challenges. Tamara, Drew, Greg, thanks for joining us on Hardly Working this morning. We appreciate your getting up early in Austin to have this discussion about the sector strategies in Austin report. Really looking forward to engaging with you as well as Mason Bishop and Caleb Seibert, who worked closely together in creating this report and hearing about its history, why you did it, what were some of the things you were thinking about, where you think it's headed, and what we've learned so far from the project. So we're going to start out with Tamara, and she's going to give us a description of the Austin Metro Area Master Community Workforce Plan. Why did Austin go down this path? What, What was the impetus? Well, I'll start with two words, optimize impact. Prior to the Master Community Workforce Plan, we really had a scattershot approach to workforce development, and we had a hard time measuring collectively as a community our impact. But I want to briefly, Brent, take you back in time a little bit and and describe an Austin to you before COVID and even before the Master Community Workforce Plan. If magazines gave out bumper stickers, For success, Austin would have filled up an entire back of a bumper and a back window with best of stickers. Austin was hot. Our economy was on fire. We had 59 straight months of unemployment that was below 3%. And companies were choosing Austin, moving and expanding in Austin. So much was going right, but that didn't tell the full story. What we saw is that housing prices were increasing and dispro- and it was disproportionate to those residents, our neighbors who were able to afford to stay in Austin. So we really decided that together it was time to come together with a common vision, a common agenda for how we were going to meet several goals in Austin to make Austin better and stronger for our community to optimize that impact. So we had really three charges in creating the Master Community Workforce Plan. One was affordability. How do we keep Austin 
affordable for people to live here. And that helps economic developers and other business leaders bring companies in and grow the, their talent here locally. Number two, we wanted to meet businesses' desire for talent. We know that business in order to grow needed a skilled workforce and skilled talent. And so we wanted to focus there. And then the third area of focus was to prioritize those who were most vulnerable of being left behind. So we looked at poverty and those living in poverty as a threshold for who we would prioritize. It's a culmination of bringing together a number of previous efforts. In Austin, before the Workforce Board for years has been working with economic development chambers, the University of Texas Ray Marshall Center, our community college, number of providers, and we'd had a scattershot approach of funding contracts for education and workforce development, and everyone had a motivation, Brent, to report their outcomes, but we had no clear visibility, no master dashboard, if you will, about how well we were doing as a community, and whether, frankly, any of those investments, public or private dollars, were getting the kind of results that we said we valued. So what we did in 2016 is we sat down with our local elected officials, Judge Eckhart and Mayor Adler, and together we said, okay, it's time to have a common agenda that points us to moving people out of poverty into good jobs. So you sat down and you had this conversation with your senior, other senior officials in the city because you knew you had these particular challenges that you wanted to address. Let's switch to Drew here for a second, because Drew, at the time, you were at the chamber and were engaged in this conversation. What did the chamber's role look like in this master workforce planning process? So the Chamber of Commerce's role in the master community workforce plan was to support real leadership. And, you know, the chambers are really only a bully pulpit. They don't have any direct power. They don't have any direct ability to create jobs, train people. What we can do is use a bully pulpit to encourage elected officials and people in key positions of influence to be able to take actions that can help strengthen your economy and improve a better life. We were really lucky to have Tamara Atkinson become the executive director for Workforce Solutions. She can't push string. She was someone who wanted to set a clear direction and a clear vision She reached out to many different community players to include the Chamber of Commerce and asked for our help. And, you know, we really, I think we could we could help. We had a a great market research team and she did the things that any business would hope any elected official or key appointed official would do. She pulled together the market research. She understood the market. She understood where to be able to take and make important outcome goals, which is very unusual in the public sector. She was good at at going out and vetting strategies that could accomplish those numbers, gaining sight lines into how to fund it, and making sure that there was accountability within her organization, within those whom she was contracting with, and ultimately in a way that would help ensure that you had a system that could take 10,000 people who were in poverty through training into jobs paying 200% of poverty or beyond. And ultimately, you know, we, we played a, a support role. We passed a resolution through our board. We've communicated with our companies to be able to support this vision and several of the components. We were really pleased that she worked with the Ray Marshall Center and Greg Compton, who we had worked with for a decade at that point as has many, but really a top-notch researcher. So that was our key role in the, in the process on the front end. If we could just have a little bit of back and forth now between Tamara and Drew as to what this thing looks like in operation. I want to try to give us clear a picture of how the process works. If I am a disadvantaged worker in Austin, somebody who's maybe working at a $10 an hour job, but I've got a family and I need I need something more. I hear about this project and I decide I want to take part. What would happen? So I can jump in on that one. So we created the workforce plan to be a no wrong door. So there are a number of nonprofits in the community, community-based organizations, as well as post-secondary education institutions, the community college 
being chief among them, that are all sharing their data so that we can have that sightline visibility. So for the worker on the front line, none of that matters to him or her. Instead, the person will, will go to the organization that they believe best meets their needs, and they will seek out services there, and in so doing, become part of a broader network, an ecosystem of employment support. For them. So if they come to the Workforce Development Board through Workforce Solutions, there's no wrong door. We will talk to them about their options. We will look at ways that we can support them and we will connect them to the right service. If they walk in through Goodwill Industries door first, they can also get connected to services there and be able to take advantage of services through Workforce Solutions through our federal funding streams. So we really have created in Austin, again, an employment ecosystem with no wrong door. And this is where our partner at the Ray Marshall Center is key, because as I mentioned at the top of this podcast, prior to the Master Community Workforce Plan, we had a very scattershot approach to both service delivery and our analysis of it. And so by bringing in an evaluation and assessment partner, we've been able to really braid together the data and the outcomes so that we can measure our efficiency. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that Workforce Solutions as a Workforce Development Board wants to show, Brent, is that a Workforce Board really can make a difference in a community and that we are effective stewards of both public and private resources and that we are willing to go above and beyond what is required and do what is right in our community to maximize and optimize impacts. So one, I think if I recall correctly in reading and thinking about this, I mean, one of the distinctives of the approach is that it does set a pretty high bar for participation. You concur with that? I mean, you can't take somebody with very low levels of education, very low levels of work experience, maybe multiple barriers to employment and and move them immediately into this process. Is that right? So from the very beginning, we agreed as a community that we wanted to meet people where they were. And so that means that some people are going to start at the adult basic education level, and that's going to be their on-ramp onto the superhighway that leads to that good middle wage job. And so if that's where someone is starting, if they're starting needing English as a second language or adult basic education services, we're going to meet them there. Similarly, if someone has some college, no degree, and re-enrolling and fast-tracking them to a credential is what they need, we're going to do that. So you are right that Austin's economy demands a level of high skills in order to meet our, our company's insatiable need for skilled, skilled talent. So we were, have been acting under a sense of urgency that Speed and scale are important, but we never wanted to lose focus on the who. Who are we serving? In in our community includes people that are starting at lower education levels, and the workforce plan is meant to recognize that for some people, it will be a fast track to their destination. For other people, it's a longer track. That is why we are in this for the long haul, because we know that for some people, there's going to be stops and starts. The value of working with an evaluation partner is that we are also in it for the long haul and can track outcomes month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year, four years to come to be able to see the impacts we're having and recalibrate as necessary to ensure that we can move 10,000 people in this first iteration out of poverty and into those good jobs. So before we get to the evaluation, I just want to clarify, and maybe Drew, you can weigh in on this. What are the main sectors that Austin is trying to support industry sectors in terms of building the talent pipeline to keep Austin growing? Yeah. So one of the, one of the really important things about a good leader is that you try new things. And Workforce Solutions created some sector level partnerships. They converted some old partnerships. And one of the challenges that Austin had frankly faced prior to Tamara's leadership 
was being able to, to listen to the pain that industry was feeling and then come up with an approach to try and address that pain. So I think too frequently in, in the chamber business and too frequently in workforce business, you'd convene employers, they would tell you what their pain is, and then you'd meet a second time and they'd say, hey, tell me more what your pain is. And they didn't do the hard work of translating it into a scope of, of uh, intervention that could help to address your, your pain. And Tamara and her team did that really well. And they attempted to deepen the advanced manufacturing pipeline with an effort they did called Trada, where they did some geofencing of advertising specific to certain zip codes. They did some mass media advertising in partnership with KVU and Texas Mutual. And they garnered several thousand people in those zip codes who raised their hand and said that they wanted to be able to, to upskill. They wanted to go into some traditional occupations. And she worked upon the supply chain so that they could do fulfillment and advanced manufacturing. She worked in the healthcare sector to be able to identify ways in which we could generate additional people that were at the technician level. There's always a need for registered nurses. There are multiple ways that you can address that, but for the rad techs, for the med techs and others, she created a group of people grounded in business who are identifying mechanisms to help get people through these less than a associate degree, but still a good paying job. And I think that's, I think that's really a lesson for most workforce boards out there is it's not just about listening to employers. It's not just about asking them their opinions. It's about then taking that information and coming back with a 60-70% solution and saying, what do you think on this? And then I'll go rev it back up and I'll bring it back to you again and we'll get to 80 or 90, not to let the enemy of the good, to start, to learn, to figure out what's gone right, figure out what's gone wrong, and then to try something new again. And I think that's what's important about leaders is that they attempt to, to solve problems in partnership, and then they continue to say what went right, what went wrong, and to keep going. Terrific. And that's a great segue to Greg. You are leading the effort on evaluation of this project at the University of Texas. And I'd really like to hear about how you got engaged in the project and then what you thought was important about the evaluation side and the strategies that were being used and then tell us what you think about what's happened to the project so far. So I want to commend once I feel like this is a commend Tamara session. Early on in this project, she had done really the hard work, get a sense of the scale and the numbers and, and how the system was currently operating. But she also wanted to have a baseline report where she sort of looked at the hard numbers using the data that the Ray Marshall Center has access to. And so she initially came to the center. We were currently working on another sort of similar project with Travis County. And so I think it made natural sense for her to sort of reach out to us. And, and particularly for me, part of the reason I'm so interested in the project is my research focuses on longer term solutions to poverty. There are a lot of workforce boards that are out there that do a lot of rapid employment training for individuals that's very short and that really doesn't provide a lot of deep skills that allows them to to move in the labor market. And that's really not the work that Tamara is in, and Force Board is currently engaged in, right? But right now, they're really thinking deeply about what is that training and aligning it with what employers need and ensuring that people who are in deepest need of those are, are getting connected to that. And I think that's all I can remember of the three things you asked. So I think that was just... <laughs> so tell, tell us about your evaluation strategy and what the results look like so far. Yeah, so first, uh, just the evaluation strategy here was to collect from a lot of different organizations. So this includes something like 10 or 15, maybe even data sharing agreements with various organizations, gaining access to their data in terms of their enrollment and completion, individual level data that allows us to link to Texas unemployment insurance wage records. And that's sort of how we determine whether someone is employed and what their earnings are. We get that information for every quarter or every person in the state of Texas at the Ray Marshall Center. And so it enables us to link that and sort of use administrative data to really look how effective these programs are. And, and I say that because that's, it's particularly important. A lot of training programs, their evaluations, in quotes, are based on individuals indicating that they are employed. 
right? Which is which is fine, right? That's that's good information, but there's not a sort of clear sense from administrative. They, they don't get access to that administrative data. So the administrative data sort of removes any incentive. So an individual might decide, like, I'm going to say that I'm employed with them, or they might increase the earnings that they're saying just when they're reporting that directly. So this enables us to get real access to what's really going on, and that's important because. There is sort of an incentive for programs to collect data that looks good for their organization. And so what's great about this is that you get the real access to the data, what it really says. And then organizations, all of the community-based organizations, we get their enrollment and completion data, and then we link it to their employment data. And we share that data back with them first to, to let them see these are the results that you had, let them reflect on it, let them come to us if they have questions. We want to make sure that when they see numbers of those that are employed, that they at least match what they are already getting by people you know, replying to their surveys and to answering the case managers. So this enables them to get that real sense of the data and then progressively move forward. And then we take that and then we share that with workforce solutions. And then we aggregate that data overall to see sort of how effective everyone is. And in terms of results, you know, we really have, we did the baseline year and the year one, those are the results that are, that are out right now. We're currently working on the year two report, which is out in September. But, you know, the year one, we were on track to meet our, our goals, really, to hopefully have a, a large number of individuals that are completing and going into employment and that that employment brings them 200% above federal poverty guidelines. Now, the surprise that we found was that, you know, initially when we engaged in this project, the idea is that you would You had enrollment, and then you would just increase enrollment. And then sort of down the line, that would eventually increase completion, increase employment, increase those earning above 200% poverty. So the idea is sort of from the base that that numbers. But what we found in year one is, in fact, that though, though the enrollment actually declined from the baseline year to that year, what we did see was we saw very big increases in completion. We saw big increases in those that were finding employment, and we saw an increase in those who earned above 200% federal poverty guidelines between the baseline year and year one. And I think part of that is the motivating factor of the Master Community Workforce Plan, right? The, particularly when we talk about not just employment, but those earning above 200% poverty, you know, a lot of these organizations, th- their contracts it stipulate that they get employment, but they aren't very clear as to what type of employment is really adequate, right? And so if you're not measuring it, they're not really, they weren't, I think, really thinking about it. I think they're thinking much more, we want to make sure people get employment, right? Which there is great value in that. But the project overall and the effort by Workforce Solutions really enabled them to focus on that. And I think that because of that, there were a lot of programs that had people who may have lagged an extra year that hadn't completed their program, that they really motivated those individuals within the programs to complete. And then also did a really great job trying to connect them to the labor market and really thought about those jobs. I think they The caseworkers, when they're trying to align them with employment opportunities, ask those follow-up questions. Well, what is the income that you're going to make at this? And I think people then, even those that were just individually looking for work or that were being referred to work, really thought more, well, I I could get better earnings for this, right? One of the things I love about projects like this is you you find out things that you weren't expecting. So we're hopeful that year two, we'll see similar results with this. It's definitely, we've definitely raised the bar just with year one. So if if you see the report, you'll notice that these numbers are of individuals between the baseline year and year one are pretty impressive, that increase. So I just want to dwell on that completion idea for a second. Completion is the biggest problem in some ways in workforce development, especially for disadvantaged, less skilled workers. And I particularly like Mason and, and Caleb to talk a little bit about this because it's something that we at least Caleb and I have chatted about in terms of this dynamic of improving completion rates. Maybe Mason can talk about what are the challenges that he's observed in the system, particularly on the community college side, where a lot of this training for this project is actually happening. And if Caleb could maybe share with us some of his observations about the role of the community-based organizations I want us to just dilate on that for like two minutes. So, Mason, do you want to start off on that and just talk about completion challenges? Yes, absolutely, Brent. And you know, one thing Tamara touched on as part of one of their goals is how do you help those individuals at the lower income with barriers to employment, generational poverty, and frankly, 
I think a lot of times when it comes to post-secondary training and education, one of the real challenges is if you, if you come from a family that really has no experience or attachment to post-secondary education, it could be a very overwhelming process. Just applying for financial aid is intimidating enough, never mind figuring out how to register for classes and all the other kind of myriad of things that you have to do just to get enrolled. And when you look at a lot of data nationally, persistence is a big problem between year one and year two at community colleges. You have community colleges that literally have about a 25% persistence rate from year one to year two, especially, and it's even more pronounced amongst underrepresented populations, minorities, and others, again, who don't haven't had the historical opportunity to have as much access to post-secondary education and training. So it is a real, a real challenge. I do think that one of the things Tamara touched on with that goal is that those individuals do need skills and do need opportunities and connections because we know that we live in a world now where even with the COVID situation, once as we come out of that, that access to training and skills enhancements is going to be really important. So I would just say that in terms of completion, that, that we know that that is a challenge, especially with, again, the populations that Tamara talked about as being a priority. And so I think having that enhanced focus on services and supports that help individuals both access post-secondary education, but once they are in it, support those individuals and being able to continue and complete. And frankly, if they run into a barrier issue, they have a place where they can go for some help to address that so they can remain in class or in their training program and not have to drop out because, say, there's a child care issue or my mom has gotten sick and I need to help take care of her if it's a younger person, that sort of thing. So I think that that, that focus is really important with what this project has done. Let's flip that over then to Caleb and just talk a little bit about this role that the community-based organizations play, all the partners in this very complex project. I mean, it's very complex. All the different partners kind of playing to their strengths. So why don't you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, so I think one of the things that stuck out to me pretty early on in the year one outcomes data was this discrepancy between completion rates at community college programs and completion rates that you saw at some of the community-based organizations. And I think what was interesting about that is it seemed like some of the more effective programs in the city were programs that, that we saw a unique partnership between those two organizations. So community-based organizations, maybe because of the wraparound support services or the intensive case management they're able to do, they're kind of able to shepherd people, it seems like through completing the program. But one of the interesting things on the data that I saw is at the community college level, those programs were especially effective at putting people into jobs that hit that 200 plus percent of the poverty line. So you kind of saw different strengths on either side. And I remember when I first started engaging with some people in Austin, one of the organizations that stuck out to me was was Capital Idea, which is a community-based organization in the city that's a part of this network that has a partnership with the community college system. So they cover tuition and provide some of the wraparound support services, but they really rely on the community college programs to give people those credentials that then allow them to step into into these jobs. And I think people, I mean, everyone's kind of mentioned this already, but that was one of the unique things that I saw in Austin was a willingness to partner across organizations and say, to your point, Drew, the chamber has this bully pulpit role and you were able to operate in that role well. Workforce training side has things that it does well. The community college system has things that it does well. The university is able to provide the data and the evaluation to help kind of tweak things as you move forward. So that was one of the things in the research that stuck out to me is where there were, where there was able to be specialization and partnership. It seems like the the people that were going through these programs were more successful. So I want to open that up a little bit to Tamara, Drew, and Greg, if you've got any reflections on what Mason and Caleb just shared. So I'll, I'll jump in first. I couldn't agree with you more, Caleb. I think that specialization matters and having each of us play to our strengths matters. And so that's what you're describing. And that's exactly what we did in Austin. So the workforce board has a unique role in our community as the administrator and broker of 
public and private resources and we can be in that air traffic control tower to see the inbound and outbound planes and, and measure that and then put resources where they need to be. That's our strength. The community college has a strength in terms of their educational abilities, their ability to really create and provide credentials that are valued in the marketplace. The Ray Marshall Center's report shows that the ACC credential really garners the highest wages for those that we're targeting in this plan. And Caleb, to Caleb's point, our community-based organizations provide a really invaluable safety net in the community. They create that personalized relationship with the individuals we're targeting in a way that the community college can't always do. It's not really what they're set up to do. So each of us playing to our strengths, working with economic development, the Chamber of Commerce and others on the business relationships, the sector partnerships are key. And we really haven't touched on that a whole lot in this yet. I mean, both Drew and Mason have talked about it some, but I think that really emphasizing, looking at where we've got existing organizations that work with our business community, and how we galvanize that sector-based strategy approach. I think that has really helped us learn what we've learned so far in version 1.0. We're well into 1.0, as Greg said, and the data has been looking promising pre-COVID. And so we are encouraged, but guys, this is just the beginning. Austin's not going to stop. And it's not because anyone's telling us we have to. It's because this is the right thing to do to lead in our community. And frankly, show the rest of, we hope to show the rest of the state and the country how to come together as a community, set a common vision, and drive toward it with measurable results. Drew or Greg, if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, this is Drew. You know, I think within those sector partnerships, we're in an era where people have time that they didn't have. You know, you've seen varying unemployment rates throughout the country. But one of the challenges to upskilling and to meet, meeting kind of this rapidly changing workforce has been that people have not had the time to upskill. I think that this is a, it's a very narrow window. We're not going to see it again to this degree for some time. And it really calls for leaders to take rapid action. I think that Workforce Solutions should really be acknowledged for its work to try and talk directly and in real time to claimants, not just in an analog way, not just in a phone call way, sort of like that old commercial technology when you want it, people when you need it, is that I think they are trying to build mechanisms to be able to help people in real time to connect to upskilling opportunities. You know, whereas before, at least in this market, a number of employers did not want to invest in upskilling because they thought that people would leave them. Today, they're trying to make payroll. And so I think the, the societal challenge in trying to get people to completion is when they have time on their hands, can they find an appropriate partner and be able to drive toward completion with the community cheering them on? in that endeavor with support, maybe through the next stimulus. Greg, anything you wanted to add? Yeah. First, I feel like we shifted rapidly to the COVID crisis piece here, I think, from what you were saying. So I, I, now I'm all thinking about that. But I really want to emphasize what Caleb was talking about, this sort of combined effect of being involved in a CBO that's collaborating with ACC and has an individual that's enrolled with ACC. I want to you know, be clear, some of the things that we don't often think about are the, how long some of these programs take. The better the program in some ways, right? It may take you some time to get that, complete that program. If you mentioned Capital Idea, there are individuals that completed in year one or in the baseline year from Capital Idea who had been Capital Idea program participants for like seven years, right? So these are these are long-term investments in people, and, and the reward on that long-term investment are individuals that are better able to access higher wages in the labor market and provide stability for their family. And really, ACC has such a huge opportunity here because there are so many people that they serve that could benefit from those kinds of supports, really, because that's what, that's what Capital Idea is doing, providing just supports to people that are ACC. So there's really such a, a need, I think, for that, that that's really there. And also thinking, you know, long term, I think that early there was a city auditing report several years ago, I think as this was just getting started, 
And they really tended to view it as like a one-year sort of piece. Like, let's look at how outcomes look in one year. Those who enter in that year and those who complete in that year. And they said, well, the retention's just, it does not look very good. People are not completing in that year. Well, you know, as the baseline report showed, like if you look over a three-year period, the CBOs completed like 90% of the people that were in those programs. So they're really they're pretty effective at doing that. It just takes longer than that one-year time frame. And I think we just really need to be cognizant of that. And I say that because in light of the COVID crisis, I think there is sort of a sense that you can wrap it. I mean, there are lots of things that are really cool that are going on that all the other people talk about, but really the, it takes time. And so the labor market that people are going to be moving into, what does that look like? I mean, right now, I will say a lot of the programs that are, that are currently in the master community workforce plan that we evaluate, a lot of those actually are engaged and produce people who would be in essential workers in some way, right? In healthcare, there's IT, uh, manufacturing and skilled trades. Like there are a lot of people who really would qualify for, for, I think, the essential category for work, which would be good. It keeps you, it keeps you working. And so, so I think that's a benefit. But what does the labor market look like on the other side of this? I think we need to be thoughtful about that as we engage in these training programs because people will be completing maybe not within this one year. They'll be taking some time potentially to do so. And we want to provide the best outcomes possible that we can for those folks. We did sort of just slide right into COVID, which is, of course, the topic that everybody wants and everybody wants to talk about because it's on their mind. So the first thing I think of when I go, when I wake up in the morning, the last thing I can think about when I go to sleep at night is, you know, what's going on in the world. Mason and I have been having a lot of conversations about policy issues related to the restart as it relates to the workforce systems and worker needs. But I do want to go back, just sort of pull back and have the three of you give us your perspective on how Austin is being impacted by COVID and then go to what you think right now. I know this is, we're we're in a fog right now, so it's hard to tell what you think some of the key challenges and opportunities are with the restart both as it relates to this project, but just even workforce generally. So Tamara, do you want to kick us off on that? Sure. Thank you so much. So now I think what, eight, 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 nine weeks into COVID, I, I have the ability to be reflective on how this is changing in Austin. And I would say from the public workforce system perspective, I'd really summarize it in, in with three words and how our community has been. Number one has been respond. We were all hands on deck coming together to respond to this crisis too. And this is where I think we are now is recovery. We are working together to help our community recover. And there's a number of things I can, another number of examples I can give there. And then three is reimagine. And that is that it would be a shame not to build our resiliency as a community, as it relates to connecting local people to local jobs, which is what this workforce plan is all about, if we didn't take the reality of our environment now as a result of COVID and use it to reimagine how we should and could be better serving our most vulnerable in our community. So I can give Mason and Brent and Caleb, I can give more examples in that, but I'd Love to have Drew and uh, Greg also be able to chime in. I'd add to that. The Austin economy has taken a pretty significant increase in unemployment 25 times what it was a year ago. We had a fantastic economy, as Tanner had talked about before, the hospitality industry, the, you know, just like everywhere else in the country, travel restaurants have just really gotten decimated and it's going to take some time for them to recover because we've had a pretty virtual workforce and one that can move pretty quickly. The business and professional services have been able to move online with some dislocation, but still they've been able to to be stronger. The semiconductor community was viewed as essential and they they were able to continue work after a little kerfuffle, the construction work from our, we, we've gotten very far behind on our infrastructure and our housing supply. Those have not gotten back to where they were, but they have been reasonably back to, to normal. I think this, this broader challenge is going to be in this COVID and post-COVID environment. 
is are we going to have the venture capital to create the new startup enterprises that are going to be able to pivot and grow into these new industries? Are we going to have those companies that are going to be providing the infrastructure for that next level of innovation? And, you know, California has such a more robust venture capital industry than we do. And just the shift, and I think it's partially what's happening with the stock market with the overweighting of the big five tech companies within the index is they are having a larger and larger influence on the overall economy. And we have to make sure Austin is part of that, part of that next generation of innovation and of talent. And, you know, I I will add one last thing, which is, you know, higher ed did shift to online and probably more effectively than K-12, who I would say has been in panic mode from day one. And so, you know, higher ed has, is more closely tied to the market in that they, many universities rely on tuition for their bottom line. And K-12 in this state relies on property taxes. So public schools are not going to feel as much of the burn in the fall that universities will. And I think as a result, are way behind on planning for a hybrid school environment when people are going to be leaving the payroll in the end of May. So we've got a huge amount of work that has to be done in the next couple of weeks. And I think this this group of students are gonna are gonna feel this pain, especially students that were behind for a long time. Greg, anything from your perspective? I mean, I would definitely just all of those comments are very prescient and important. To me, I think that one of my chief primary concerns during this time period is that people who are employed and are making money are because of the current environment and continuing uncertainty around everything. People who have money are less likely to spend it. And people who don't have money are not spending it. And so there is this downward pressure that is sort of occurring, right? And as long as this uncertainty continues, I think that as Drew mentioned with venture capital, but just in general, people are likely to spend less. And that is just not good. You know, we rely on that sort of cycle of spending to produce sales tax and increase the revenues for the city, et cetera. The shortfalls, longer this goes on, there will be great shortfalls for universities and also for the city and for the state. Our legislature is going to meet in January of next year. And it's probably going to be spending a lot of time thinking about how are we going to either fill the holes that are in the budget or how are we going to cut back? And this is really not a time to cut back. This is a time to think about investing, think about what to do. And I think that some of the difficulty here is because we didn't know certain things, but I think we've all heard those stories. This would have been a perfect time to work on roads because nobody's driving the roads. So that's a great time to do a big infrastructure bill, get that stuff out, right? But because we don't have certainty about how things are going to unfold, it just drives people to, to sort of turn inward and to, and to not really you know, engage in the labor and spending. This is such an American thing, I think, in a way. When you think about it, we've been in this where we are now for two and a half or three months, and there's an impatience to like, well, let's get on it. Let's get started solving these problems. That's a great thing. That, that impatience is really important in terms of people thinking forward and trying to get there. So I appreciate your your kind of hitting that note of, you know, let's not waste this time. Let's figure out how to use it. That's a really, really important idea. I know that both Mason and Caleb were trying to signal, signal me earlier to, that they wanted to get in. I'm sorry I didn't reach back to them. As the principal authors on this report, I want to make sure that we've really pulled out the important stuff that readers need to pay attention to, policymakers need to pay attention to. I'd like to make sure that both of you, both Mason and Caleb, have a chance to get back in here and and cover anything they particularly want to highlight in the report. Yeah, I'll just, one of the questions I had, which we touched on briefly, but in some ways may be a good summation of this conversation, is obviously in the title of the report and in the report itself, One of the things Caleb and I really tried to emphasize is this term sector strategies and our belief that often in the workforce development field, we throw a lot of 
terminology around and then never really define what that terminology means. So one of our real goals of this case study was to look at the term sector strategies. We offered a definition of that, which is really how do you shrink the gap between the demand and supply for labor using career demand-driven career pathways. And really, it's more than just sector partnerships. A lot of times, people default to the idea of just the sector partnership. But as we've heard in this conversation, that's one part of the overall sector strategies puzzle. So I guess my question at this point would be, in particular for Tamara, but also Drew and Greg as well, given sort of this definition of sector strategies and our desire to be able to look at Austin and have something that can be replicated in other places, really kind of in a succinct way, what would you say are the one or two or three most important elements of your initiative in the context of this idea of sector strategies? What is most important and what can be and should be replicated in other communities? Uh, thank you very much for that opportunity. So succinctly, a couple of points. I think leadership matters. I think early on in our process in Austin, we had local elected leadership that said, we want to do something more and better on behalf of our community that will meet both the industry's needs for skilled talent and see that our local residents have an opportunity to compete for those jobs being created. So Number one, leadership matters. Number two, I would say it's being courageous enough to set a common agenda and to create a community vision for where we want to go. I've mentioned on this podcast already that prior to the Master Community Workforce Plan, we had a very scattershot approach to how workforce development was funded, how impacts were reported. And so by having a common plan, a common agenda, we organized and gave ourselves the guardrails to say what we are willing to fund and what we're not and how we're going to measure it. And as Greg said earlier, we also were courageous enough to hold ourselves accountable above and beyond what the funders were requiring of us. It was, It is no longer in Austin, Texas, okay just to measure people getting a job. We're measuring whether they're getting a good job so that we can report back to our business community return on investment. We can go to sleep at night knowing that we really are helping our most vulnerable residents be better off. So I think that matters. I would say third would be that endorsements and lining up the right partners also matters. So early on, it was important to us that we have endorsement of our plan by our city council, by the Travis County Commissioner's Court, by the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, by the Community College, and so on. It was very, very important that we had key leadership buy-in And I would say, last but not least, and this cannot be undervalued, is the having an independent, separate research or evaluation partner. Because as Greg said, oftentimes in a funding situation, organizations are motivated to report their shiny outcomes and really sweep under the carpet the not so shiny parts of the work that they're doing and report just on their successes and not where they maybe need help. We took a position from the very beginning in Austin that we were not about putting any organization out of business, but we were about focusing resources in the right programming areas that were getting the outcomes that made a difference in our community and help people be better off. And so I would say that those would be my key. It's leadership matters, have a common agenda, get endorsements from the key leaders that can help have your back and and promote the work and then make sure you've got the right partners, including evaluation and research to help you make sure you stay on track even when you get off track. Tamara, may I ask just a quick follow-up based on what you just said? Because that, that's wonderful. It's critically important. Leadership, accountability, <clears throat> transparency. What advice would you offer to other local workforce development boards under the WIOA system, because I think one of the things you've really been able to do is put in practice, I think, what the vision of a local workforce development board is, which is really more of that strategic partner bringing together the resource and community. And yet, I think part of the challenge is so many boards in the system get mired down in the actual delivery of services and don't really step back and kind of fulfill that 
role of the bigger picture of what you just articulated. Do you have any quick advice on how you've been able to manage and focus on that strategic leadership versus getting mired in the day-to-day service delivery, which kind of has maybe shorter term impacts versus the longer term impacts you're seeking? Yeah, thank thank you, Mason, for asking that. I would say my quick advice, I'll go back to number one, leadership matters. So my advice to other workforce boards would be look at who's on your board of directors, talk to your board of directors, where necessary at times, if you are a workforce board staff leader, look at how can you build a body of board members who share a vision that you're looking for. So leadership matters and then have a critical conversation with key leaders in your community. Your workforce boards by design work with local elected officials. We work, we are supposed to work with our economic development leaders and our education leaders. So my advice would be look at your workforce board those who are your bosses and and really meant to be representative of your community, galvanize and unite their vision toward being more and better as an organization to meet your community's needs and then work with your leadership in your community and see if through those conversations, you can surface what that common agenda is for your community that makes sense to bridge that gap between what businesses are demanding in terms of skills and and what those organizations charged with uh, training up the workforce, you know, close that gap, as you said, and really live that vision of a sector strategy and sector partnership. Thank you, Tamara. I think, again, one of the things you did with local leaders is gave them a reason to engage too. And that's that's just as critically important because if you don't provide people a reason for engaging and why it's important. Sometimes they they don't engage. So thank you so much. Caleb, I, I'll turn it over to you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, that was great. I think maybe the only thing that I'd bring up that we've hinted at and talked about throughout the conversation is your commitment to real-time local labor market information and taking a pretty proactive approach to gathering that, to disseminating it to the right people and I think one of the things I heard in the research consistently, and as I just talked to different stakeholders in Austin, was some of the challenges that the lag in federal and state data can have on the work that you're doing. We talked about completion rates earlier. We highlighted this in the report, but I remember in a conversation with Drew, he was talking about a survey that was done for people that had dropped out of these community college programs to try to understand why did you drop out and what could we do to help you plug back in? And they saw some good results from that. So I I know. That, the Bridging the Talent Gap survey, a few other surveys you guys have done along the way. But I think specifically, my question would be, as we look at the rebuild from COVID, what have you guys done already? Try to get a handle on what's actually happening in terms of the labor market in Austin. And maybe what ideas do you have or what are you wrestling with for some solutions, both for Austin, but also for other other cities and boards? Sure. Well, I'll jump in really quickly. I'm going to go back to that framework of respond, recover, reimagine. So in the respond category, the very first thing we did when Mayor Adler called for a state of emergency disaster in Austin on March 6th, and that led to the cancellation of the South by Southwest conference, which led to the cascading really downward cycle in Austin in our economy with restaurants and bars and entertainments closing down. Caleb, is we, is we were immediately responsive to our community. And so we, we set up a Jobs Now posting on our website where we listed real-time job opportunities because there are still and there were still employers hiring. So we wanted to let people know that we wanted to support our community, particularly see that industries that are, were and are essential could find the essential workers they needed. Number two, we posted a single phone number and made it very, very easy to access information. We knew there was a lot of fear from our business community who were facing possible layoffs. And our motivation was to, when at all possible, see that businesses had the right tools and resources information to retain their workforce when at all possible. So we just jumped into action working day and night through easy to access information, making ourselves as accessible as possible with information both to businesses and to impacted workers who were understandably worried. 
At Workforce Solutions, we do not administer the unemployment insurance system, but many people saw us and see us as a resource for information. So we became local navigators for how to apply for unemployment insurance. And so, so really, that's been our response. As we've moved into recovery, and I would say, Caleb, that you are right. One of the strengths in Austin has been our commitment to data visibility. We now have, and Caleb and Mason and Brent, this is kind of fresh since I last talked to you, Austin now has access to real-time information on unemployment insurance claimants. So whether they've received, actually been monetarily deemed eligible, or they have applied and are awaiting or have been denied, we are now getting from our state agency weekly reports that list information on those who have applied for information. And so what are we doing with that? Data is only as good as you're willing to act on. And so we are now going through those lists and we are curating specific opportunities that will be available both from an employment and a skill training and when we can a both and approach for those unemployment insurance claimants and reaching out to them. And then the the last thing I'll say as I talk about reimagine, that third R in that platform is we are finalizing a contract with a third-party technology vendor that will create for us an access hub in Austin. And to our knowledge, we will be the one of the first, if not the first workforce board in Texas that will do this maybe in the country. Don't know for sure. Our friends at AEI might be able to help me understand that. But we're taking the lead at the local level to have a a technology solution that learners and workers can input some very basic information and see what public and private programs and employment opportunities they are eligible for, curate that into a to-do list for those learners, and then nudge them with text messages and other correspondence to rapidly get that worker, that learner to the opportunity and then be able to track long term, we will track that closed loop system to see that they got what they came to us for. And so we expect to be able to braid into that tool, this unemployment insurance claimant information so that we can use data analytics to look inside that data set and be able to focus and individualize the contact we make to the claimants based on the opportunities that they are looking for in our community. So I think that Austin is doing everything we can to really see that we reimagine a community that can come out of this disaster and this crisis much stronger from a sector strategy approach in how we continue to meet our business's need for skilled talent. That's terrific. And I think that's a great place for us to wrap up. With that, we'll say goodbye. I look forward to hearing more about your project in the future. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet. Thank you. This was great. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hardly Working. I'm your host, Brent Orell, and I hope you tune in next time to learn more about the state of workforce development in America. Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast. Let us know at vocation at AEI.org if there are any topics you'd like us to cover. As always, we hope you find the job that fits so well, it feels like you're hardly working.